Morning, Southside Bible Church. <clears throat> Special welcome to anyone who might be visiting us for the first time. We're glad to have you here to worship with us. And again, there is a picnic afterwards, and we bought 100 pieces of fried chicken, so come and we will feed you. Excited to have you. As a church, we are studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. So if you would turn to Romans chapter 11, I think I'm going to skip. I just, I've been overwhelmed with what all God has been doing in the midst of this body over the last few years as we've been studying Romans. And so I'm just grateful that you're growing in your love for Christ and your love for one another and for the lost and just seeing so many beautiful things happening in our midst. And so we give God thanks because it's the manifestation of him working in us is, is being metamorphosed into his people. So to God be the glory. This morning, did I say chapter 10 or just Romans? Something. Turn to chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. It's hard for me to start a new chapter. I, I fall in love with chapters and I just want to stay there. And when I go to a new one, I, I feel kind of vulnerable. And so we're beginning a new chapter, chapter 11. It's our final ascent to the Mount Everest of revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where we look out at this spectacular view of God and his dealings throughout history and all of eternity. And we're all going to just cry out for from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. Amen. This chapter is Paul continuing to answer the question back in Romans 9, 6, but it's not as though the word of God has failed. And so he wants to, to deal with this, this majority of God's covenant people, Israel, at this time of the writing are rejecting their Messiah that they've been waiting thousands of years for. The whole Old Testament is building on this great promise that God's going to send a Messiah. And we keep learning about him and what he'll do, who he'll be, how he'll accomplish this redemption. And I just love the, the glory and the beauty of the Old Testament showing us this. Until finally, at last, the fullness of the times, Jesus Christ enters into the world. Eternity steps into time. And that verse in John 1, his own did not receive him. They rejected what all of history has been building and moving to. In fact, they didn't just reject him, they killed him. You talk about anticlimactic. From first glance, it looks like God cannot keep his promises to his covenant people. How he is going to keep us Gentiles then if he, he couldn't keep, uh, let's say, wild branches being grafted in, how's he going to keep us if he couldn't keep the natural branches he'll talk about in chapter 11? So if he can't keep those, how's he going to take care of our salvation? And so Paul has been given some really big answers to that question. In chapter 9, he said, not all Israel is Israel. There's always been a remnant and that they are saved not by their ethnicity, but by the sovereign grace of God calling them into life like uh, Isaac being born to a 100-year-old father and 90-year-old mother. Uh, God gives birth to his people. Second, Paul tells us that Scripture foretold this. Throughout the Old Testament, we were told that the Gentiles would come in. They would believe in the promise made to Abraham. He says it's for the nations will be blessed through your seed, Abraham. Third, Paul turns and says Israel is responsible for their rejection, their unbelief. They're looking at the cornerstone, the promised Messiah, and in their hearts rejecting him. I will not believe. I won't submit to your righteousness. I'm going to get my own through the law. They're responsible. It's, it's them that has rejected God. And now he's turning to his last argument, and he's going to look at the history of redemption to teach us more. What becomes of the nation of Israel that has rejected their Messiah? The question is, are they just thrown away? Are they tossed in the garbage, just Johnny-come-latelys? And so as we look at history, the question is, what is it good for? And some say absolutely nothing. But quite frankly, to know God deeply we have to take him on his, his own terms, not what we want, not what we like, not what we think. That's the Bible. He gave us a book, and it's inerrant. 
It's perfect. It's without error. It's been inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. And it's the records of the events of history and God's redemption. And he interprets it for us. He helps us understand it and know what he's doing. And so we see all of history then is for the glory of God where we're laboring at the end of this chapter. History exists to display the glory of God. And chapter 11 is going to explain that history for us. And and it will close with the way it should. To God be the glory forever. So I want you to let these truths lead you into that. I'm tired of it leading into systems and fights and arguments and pride. It should lead us to a deep, deep humility in giving God glory for all of history for the great salvation that he has brought to us. And I pray that is what will happen in every heart in this church. This chapter's big. It's not just history, it's majestic history. And this is where Paul has been leading us since Romans 1.1. This is where this whole gospel has been bringing us to the praise and the glory of God. And that's what I pray for this church. So let's go to our God and ask him to meet us in this chapter. Father, I pray that you reveal yourself to us in truth. Lord, that what, what comes out of this is hearts and souls that are overwhelmed with their God and give him all the glory. We quit becoming his counselor. We quit telling him how he has to do things. And we just praise and worship you for who you are and how you work. You are worthy of all the praise. God, let that be the the truth of every heart in here. Let us be done with self-glory. There's just something so much bigger and better than exalting ourselves this amazing God that we've been seeing in Romans. God, let every heart be taken up with it and be changed and transformed by beholding the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen. Romans 10, 21. But as for Israel, God says, all the day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient an obstinate people. That's been the history of Israel. And so the question is a very fair one. God, if they pushed you away, will you push them away? If they cast off Christ, will you cast them off? And Paul's going to answer that for us in chapter 11. And so this morning, I want to just take a look at our passage in two simple headings. This is your outline. Uh, Both A's, you should be able to memorize this. Next week when I quiz you, I want you to be able to say, One through three is Paul's assertion, or one through four, and then verses five through six is Paul's application of that. So let's begin with our first point, uh, his assertion in verse one. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And so after all that we've seen through the Old Testament, Just this rejection of Israel, stoning the prophets, killing everyone who's been sent to them. Now what they did to Jesus, all day long, the holding out of an invitation of love to come to God in this salvation. You should conclude, God has rejected them. How could he not? How could God not reject that? And so Paul's going to answer this question. Has he rejected his people, Israel? And he's going to answer it with no, 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 no. That's your message this morning. No's. Five no's. And if you start to say, I wonder if Paul's saying no. I just hope you walk away going, no. He's going to give you five beautiful arguments. God has not done that. He has not rejected his people. Has he? Let's go home. No. No. Let's look at the first one, and it's, it's no rhetorically. The question Paul asks in the Greek, the design here, it's, it assumes a negative answer when he asks it. It's, it's like when me and Laura might be going out somewhere, and she'll look at me and say, you're not going out like that, are you? <laughs> and it assumes, of course you're not. <laughs> Same here. 
But even the content of the question, I think, draws it out, saying God has not rejected his people, just rejected his people. And so just right away, you can just see that he hasn't rejected his people. So a quick note of interpretation, as we journey through chapter 11, I am more and more convinced that his people in this chapter 11 is the nation of Israel. It's not the elect remnant. It is the nation of Israel. He's going to talk about how he deals with a nation and every good all millennialist commentator that I've read who I love have said, this is the nation of Israel. I don't know what it does to my argument or my presuppositions, but you can't get exegetically away from this is the nation of Israel. So here I stand, I can do no other. <laughs> this is his people as a corporate nation. Just like, I'll just read a couple of verses for you. We'll, we'll journey this, but verse 12. Now, if their transgression, the nation of Israel, is riches for the world... And their failure is riches for the Gentile, how much more will their fulfillment be? And in verse 25, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel, the nation, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so this chapter is Paul's dealings with the nation of Israel as a whole. Uh, and, and so we have already dealt with the remnant in chapter 9 and 10. <clears throat> and we will again this morning in verses 1 through 5. So Paul's burden is how do we understand and think about Israel as a nation in light of redemptive history? And thus, a no answer to has God rejected them just by the rhetorical question. The second no is, I'm going to say, a grammatical no, if you'll look with me in verse 1, he uses this phrase the ninth time in the book of Romans. Uh, it's different ways, may genoito, may genetai, but it's may it never be. Has God rejected his people? I, Paul used this when he said, should we just sin that grace might abound? May genetoi, don't even let your mind begin to go in that direction. You can't even think that way. Has God rejected his people? No, don't let your mind even start going that direction. Stop, is what he's saying. Third, the third no. No, 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 personally. Paul says, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And Paul now presents himself as evidence A. And it's a beautiful argument. Of all the Jews that I think I have read about in the Old Testament, as they reject God, Paul would be the foremost one in my mind of who do you think God would reject? The one who said, if you name the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to be killed. You're going to be put in prison. I'm against you. I hate you. I will kill you. He had venom against anyone who named the name of Jesus Christ. As to, as to a persecutor of the church, zeal. He should be cast off and damned forever. But the apostle Paul found grace and he says, now I'm the poster child of God's grace and God's patience toward me. Paul, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a pure breed. I was circumcised on the eighth day. And all I did was have opposition to Jesus Christ. Oh my, God has not rejected Israel, has he? I'm an, I'm an Israelite. And I sit here with a love and a belief and a passion in Jesus Christ to show you, no, God has not rejected them. Amen. Fourth, I'm going to say no theologically. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And that word is not new to us who have been studying through Romans. You remember back in Romans 8.29, the, the daisy chain, the chain of grace of how God saves us. And when he foreknew us, it was to set his love on us. He predestined, he called, he justified, and he glorified. And so to, he, to, he sets a love or an affection upon them. And it's important that in Romans 8, 29 through 30, it was salvation. And this, this we're looking at is um, this foreknowing is to bring this nation uh, into a covenant relationship throughout the Old Testament, hesedness, uh, covenantal loyalty, faithfulness, to love them and to be their God. 
And God would use them to bring about his purposes uh, in redemption. It's not a promise ever that every Jew who ever lived would be saved. That would blow up all of Romans 10, 11, and really the whole book if your bloodline can save you. That is not what Paul's getting at here. What he's getting at Amos 3, 2, where God said, you only, Israel, have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I'll punish you for all of your iniquities. I'll treat you as children. Listen to Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord, set apart to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt." 1 Samuel 12, 19, the context is Israel rejects God's rule over them and say, we want an earthly king like all the other nations. So all the people said to Samuel, pray for the servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die. For we've added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. We've rejected the real king and asked for an earthly one. We're in trouble. And Samuel said to the people, do not fear You've committed all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and you must not turn aside, for when you would go after futile things which you cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. For the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, which was back to Romans 8, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself." So God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, whom he foreordained, and whom he set his love upon. God prepared a special people for himself, and he's called them out, beginning with Abram, and he's not cast them away. He has foreordained this people for himself, and he has not changed his mind. There's no change in the purposes of God and the unchanging, everlasting God. And we will see how God's foreknowledge and favor gets worked out with a nation as we journey chapter 11, as we've already looked at how it's worked out in an individual. So fifthly, I want to look at no, 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 no. The fifth one is historically. And look with me in verse 2. <clears throat> God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. And so Paul now goes and grabs this historical event to show that this is how God has worked throughout history in 1 Kings 19 with Elijah. And most of you are familiar with this story, but I'm going to give you a quick synopsis. Uh, It's uh, an incredible apostasy going on in Israel. Instead of worshiping God, they're worshiping Baal, and they're offering up their children to Molech and all these sins that are going on in Israel. And Elijah comes and he challenges the priest of Baal to a contest. And they say, ask Baal to send fire to consume the sacrifice on the altar, and I will ask my God. And they they start crying out, Baal, they're doing all these things and gashing themselves, and, and nothing happens. And then Elijah goes, and God just comes and consumes the sacrifice. He consumes the wood. He consumes the stones and all the water in the trench. And then Elijah has 400 prophets and priests of Baal killed right there. And the news of what happened reached Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, who told his wife Jezebel about it, and she swore to have Elijah killed immediately. Elijah gets scared, and he fled to a 40-day journey into the remote wilderness of Mount Horeb. And the next morning, God said to Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah responded in this. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. 
For the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. They've torn down thy altars and they killed thy prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. <clears throat> so God gave Elijah what he needed. He gave him a vision of himself. There's this wind that rends the mountains and broke the rocks, earthquake and fire. And then God repeats the question, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah gives the same answer, and God says to Elijah, go appoint two new kings, Hazael, the king of Aram, and Jehu, the king of Israel, and anoint Elisha to be the successor as God's prophet. And then God says this, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel of all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. And so this is what Paul is quoting. Uh, he hits on this idea here now of a remnant. And so there was a remnant in Israel whom God had kept for himself and preserved from the worship of Baal. And this example is brought up to prove that God has not cast off Israel as his chosen beloved people, and he's going to keep showing this remnant idea. And so this salvation of a small remnant from the total mass is su su sufficient proof uh, of that God is still working in this nation. And as there was in Paul's day when he penned this, there was a remnant, and there is today, as I preach this this morning, uh, there's a remnant, and some sit here in our church this morning. And so that is Paul's assertion. And what got me out of bed this morning is Paul's application. So wake up. I know it's warm. You're thinking about a picnic, but I want you to wait till you see the application now that Paul makes of this. Verses 5 through 6. In the same way then, there's also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And so there's a remnant. There was Elijah, 7,000, and so now there's a remnant. Not all are rejecting the gospel. And the question is, how did this remnant come about from Israel? Why has God not rejected his people? And the answer is certainly not our merit, our Jewishness, our circumcision. The answer is according to God's gracious choice. 147 times this word gracious is used. It's the root for grace. Most of them are Pauline. And he knew that it was of grace alone that this remnant had been saved. The 7,000 that did not bend their knee to Baal was by the grace of God alone. Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I was killing Christians. And there's a remnant as Paul write, is writing this saying, it's, it's only by God's gracious choice. It's God's grace that is preserving this remnant throughout history and is still drawing in the remnant Gentiles in our day. Paul never got over the grace that was shown to him. It was not merited. It was not deserved. It was unmerited and undeserved. And it was the kindness and the mercy of our God. And, and when you get it, I want you to really hear this. You never get over it. When grace finally breaks in and you finally get, it had nothing to do with you, not anything you did wrong, right. It was the freeness of God, and he chose you to give you this grace. You just spend the rest of your life going, I can't get over this. I can't get over God killing his son in my place. And he chose to reveal it to me so that my ears would hear and faith would come forth and I would get a new heart. It's the, it transforms a soul. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It's, it's all you talk about. It's what comes out of you. It's what wakes you up in the morning. Living under law, you never, you never feel that. It's just every day is your grind. But the one who gets grace, it, it is transformational. And that's what happened to Paul. It's free. It's mine. It was all God's doing. I'm loved. I'm accepted by the Savior of my soul. And now Paul is amazed that I get to preach this grace to the Gentiles, this amazing, marvelous grace. A soul encompassed with the grace of God is eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Grace demands my life, my soul, my all. Has grace taken over your heart? That's what Paul's after. All of salvation is his divine initiative to pour out grace upon grace to those who do not deserve it. And he picks the remnant. And so praise be to God 
that I don't bow my knee this morning to the bales of the United States of America. That is the only reason I'm not worshiping the idols that are all throughout our country. It's the grace of God that has caused my heart to love and worship God. I don't worship sex, fame, power, drugs, acceptance, accolades, accomplishments. Praise God that I died to the law, that I can't merit God's favor and acceptance by my own works. And I stand in the grace of God by the grace of God alone. Praise be to God for his marvelous grace. And Paul's not done yet. He wants to drive grace even deeper and never let you wonder, wonder or get confused. And so come with me to verse 6. He's gonna, it's an adversative to, to explain it further. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. This, this is a big statement that he drops right there. Grace and works are incompatible opposites. They can't marry. They can never come together. If saved by grace, it can't be by works. If, if it is, grace isn't grace. And if you're saved by works, it cannot be by grace, or works aren't really works. It's the foundation stone in the whole Bible. John Calvin said, I, I want to just quote him on this comparison of the opposites, grace and works. He said, the grace of God and the merit of works are so opposed to one another that if we establish one, we destroy the other. If then we cannot allow any consideration of works in election without obscuring the unmerited goodness of God, which Paul so greatly desired to commend to us in election, those fanatics who make the worthiness which God foresees in us the cause of our election, which we spent a long time in chapter 9 on, must consider what answer they are to give to Paul. Whether it is past or future works, which we are considering, Paul's statement that grace leaves no rooms for works will always resound in our ears. He states that God was led to make this distinction for no other reason than his own good pleasure and contends that any concession given to works detracts to the extent of his marvelous grace. Faith is the result of God's grace, not the cause of God's grace. And so we are hopelessly lost, Romans 1 through 3. Nothing can remedy it. We're a spiritual dead corpse. We must have help wholly outside of ourselves. We must be made alive by the Spirit of God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. How could salvation come in any other way than the unmerited grace of God without any relationship to anything that we might do. I've been fighting this for three years, and if there's anyone left still looking to works, may they die this morning. This is to take away the boast and the confidence of being a Jew. God has to save us if we're his people. I'm from Abraham's line. I have to be a child of God. That was the nonsense going on. If, if I'm a keeper of Torah, the law, he's got to save me. I give, I fast, I give sacrifices, I follow the law to the T. That's the law. I've been found blameless. Just rip it out. The only reason that Israel has not been cast off is because of the grace of God alone. His choosing to be gracious to them and calling out a remnant. And as we proceed through this chapter, I believe... What he's going to teach us is at the end of history, he's going to save a whole nation, like six million Jews at one time that are going to fall on their knees and this hardening that's over them right now is going to be lifted and they're going to believe in the Messiah that he came and died on that cross for them and lived the life that they should have and they're going to have faith. I, we're, I'm going to hold off, have self-control the next week, but I've read about revivals and awakenings, and I, I love them. I've never heard of a whole nation being saved at once. And it's just pure grace of what he's going to do. Just pure grace that God would harden the Jews so that the Gentiles, many of us here this morning, 
would come into this salvation from every tribe, tongue, and nation. You've got to start caring about history. You, you've been brought in because God hardened this nation. And he's in gathering the Gentiles from, from all the lands until the fullness of the Gentiles, he says, are brought in till the last one believes in Jesus Christ. You and I, you and I, and pray that millions and millions of more from this globe will be brought in. That's our calling. And it's nothing but the grace of God that the nations are being gathered in and Gentiles are believing upon Christ and being saved. Hear this. Let grace overwhelm your heart this morning. I have been graced by God to have faith in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. I pray, let us exalt in the grace of God. I've been graced. That is what Paul lived in, rested in. Every, every letter he writes, grace to you. I just want you to revel and drink up grace. He began every letter wishing it for his readers. I, I want to, that's what I want for every one of you. May your hope be built on nothing less than the grace of God and Jesus Christ. That's what I have been fighting for to bring you to that sweet shalom and rest in the grace of Almighty God and Jesus Christ. God has poured out this grace on a remnant of Jews throughout history and their great rejection and murder of their Savior. I want you to hear this. He hasn't discarded this people. He says in chapter 11, he's hardened them for a season. And today, he's still saving a remnant of Jews, his chosen ones. But the majority are hardened so that the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. And this Gentile remnant is brought in by the sovereign grace of God, and he grants you faith so that you will believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, look to him alone for your salvation. God's peace plan has only one point. Give up trying to impress him with your works and embrace the work of Jesus Christ. Christ is the end of the law for everyone who believes. And that is how you know if you're of his remnant. Now, what I'm excited about. If I could summarize this, it would be this. The future of Israel is not their faithfulness. So far, it's just been a future of unfaithfulness. It's a future based on God's grace. And I want you to get this. If anything proves free, sovereign grace, it's Israel's future of a great national salvation. Listen to Isaiah 46, 12 through 13. He says, God says, listen to me, you stubborn-minded who are far from my righteousness. I will bring near my righteousness. It's not far off. That's what we were looking at in Romans 10. And my salvation will not delay, and I will grant salvation in Zion and my glory for Israel. A remnant, by God's gracious choice, will confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts he was raised from the dead. A nation with a history of resistance and rebellion, forgetting the mercies of God, All day long, I've held up my hands to a disobedient and stiff-necked people. It just continues to this very day. And God's purpose and grace toward his people cannot be turned away. A great salvation is coming upon this whole nation when millions and millions and millions will fall at the feet of Jesus Christ and weep over their Messiah. This blows my heart away the faithfulness of God to such unfaithfulness. Why? Because it's all of grace. So where this whole argument began, what has set me free this week, was Romans chapter 8, where God says when you believe in Jesus Christ, you're secure. There's no more condemnation upon you, and nothing will ever be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And Paul starts throwing out everything that could possibly separate you. And he finally just says, or anything ever created, everything other than God can't separate you. Even your sin can't separate you from God. Well, what about Israel? 
That's a great promise. I, I got fired up in chapter 8. That's, God can't lose me. <laughs> he won't because his name's at stake, his power, his grace. He's going to do what he said he'll do. It's powerful. But I just, Israel, they've been rejected. God couldn't bring them to the end. Something did separate them from God. The mighty and powerful answer is no, it didn't. God has used them mightily to establish his salvation. Types, shadows, dealings to bring Messiah into the world and to decree their rejection so that the fullness of all the Gentiles would come in, celebrate. You're here because of God's sovereign hardening this morning. And then there's a day where he says, I've decreed, I'm going to lift that hardening and I'm going to circumcise their hearts and the whole nation will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Yeah! <laughs> to put on display a God who wants to show mercy to all by free sovereign grace. And so I've spent a good amount of time thinking and meditating and praying over this, saying, so what? What does that mean to me today? And I know there's some of you going, I, I don't know why I go to this church. I just want to learn how to love my wife better. It's, this is it. It takes Paul's point of Romans 8, and it undergirds it, and it strengthens it. Because God will not cast off a nation like this. They killed his son. His son, I was like a mother hen. I just wanted to gather you like chicks. And you were unwilling. And God would not cast them off. He's punished them. He's hardened them. But how can I turn my heart from my beloved? my one whom I have chosen. They can't shake his covenantal love off, his purposes and promises to them. And if he won't cast them off, and now I look at me, being under the blood of the lamb and justified and regenerated and believing in his son and loving his son and obeying his son, when I'm unfaithful, he remains faithful. God's dealings with Israel just strengthen my hope in God and Him finishing the work that He began in me. It doesn't ruin it for me like the antagonists that were, were saying all this to Paul. God can't hold His own people. It gives me 10,000 times more hope and a broken sinner like Ken Murphy that has more unfaithfulness in him than he desires or wants is safe because of the faithfulness of my God, because of grace. And that preaches to my heart so deeply. And so I read the Gospels and I go, cast them off. Be done with them, God. Punching you in the face prophesy who hit you. That's not how a wife acts to her husband or how children treat their father. Be done. And then I glance at the one yelling that who just keeps growing in knowledge and this chasm between what I know and what I do keeps increasing. And then I cry, God, don't cast me off. You should. Don't cast me off. And the answer is the same to both. By the grace of God alone, he will keep me and turn my heart to him again and again and again, more and more. How can he give me up? I'm foreknown. I'm loved by God in Christ Jesus. Oh, Ephraim, Ephraim, how can I give you up? Oh, Ken, oh, Ken, how can I give you up? You're my beloved son. And I want you to have hope this morning if you've been drifting, dry as a chip, not living the way you should. There's a faithful God that I pray would, you would see it and repent. And, and this is his faithfulness to turn your heart back to him and to follow him and love him and seek after him. Let the faithfulness of your God 
bring your heart back to your God, to follow him with everything within. Drink this up, Southside Bible Church. This is what we need. Because when you're laying in a hospital bed and you're fighting to breathe, and you know you're just a few breaths away from seeing God face to face, and you start to contemplate this great salvation, and then you start to contemplate your weak response to such a great salvation. I've sat on many deathbeds where that starts happening. And you start saying, well, he cast me off. And I look at Romans 1 through 8, and I look to Christ and say, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I look at Israel, the most blessed and common graced nation in the history of the world that was the most unfaithful in the history of the world, harlotry like no other, and God's love and purpose could not be moved off her. And I declare by the grace of God alone, your love cannot be taken off of me because of something I have done or not done. I stand in grace and I die in grace alone. And I say, Abba, Daddy, into thy hands I commit my spirit, safe and secure from all alarms. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beauty. I thank you that this chapter is to get us to worship you. God, to give you praise and marvel at how you work and what you do in history. And it's to bring about this chosen elect remnant that you have chosen before the foundation of the world to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. And you have drawn out this little group for the history of the world from Israel. And you've been drawing it out from the Gentiles. And Lord, this is the time of the ingathering of Gentiles. Let us wake up to our calling. God, let us give our heart, mind, and soul and strength to go and take this gospel to our neighbors, to the world, Lord, to Gentiles proclaiming that Jesus Christ has died and offers us salvation. Lord, I pray, let it, let it do its work. And let us marvel that you say because of the sake of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the promises you made, that at the end of time, you're going to save this nation only because of sovereign grace. And I, pr I just praise you Lord, for who you are and how you work in history. And to you be all the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said.